Good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about MDR TB in children. Uh, TB is the hot topic of this decade, and we are going to talk about uh, drug resistance, which is on the increase in uh, pediatric TB. Now, if we talk about drug resistant TB, when we talk about MDR TB, we are basically talking about uh, resistance to the two basic drugs of TB treatment, that is INH and rifampicin. So any bug that is resistance to both INH and rifampicin is called as MDR-TB. Then we have various other definitions like monoresistance where you're resistant to one drug, polyresistance where you're resistant to more than one drug, but this would be apart from INH and rifampicin. XDR-TB where you have MDR plus of quinolone plus an aminoglycoside resistance. And we talk nowadays about rifampicin resistance, which is what we detect on our gene expert. We pick up rifampicin resistance. We assume that all the patients who are rifampicin resistance would have additional INH resistance and then we label these patients as MDR and start the treatment on the basis of MDR-TB treatment. Now MDR-TB in children, there is a lot of new things that is happening, especially in diagnostics and uh, especially in treatment. The topic of MDR-TB itself is too vast, so we'll be just covering what's new that's happening. In the diagnostics, we have been using uh, GeneXpert for a pretty long time to pick up rifampicin resistance. But there are certain other tests that are now available, that is your line probe assay and the MTBDR plus uh, in which you pick up additional drug resistance also, like your ethambutol, ofloxacin, pyrazinamide, all those. The new thing in Expert is now we have an Expert Ultra. The older version of uh, GeneXpert used to pick up uh, positive reports only if there were more than 113 one bacilli per ml whereas the new ultra has a lower detection so you it needs only 16 bacilli per ml so it's got a very high sensitivity gene expert originally was uh, recommended only for approved for only for uh, diagnosis of pulmonary tb but with this ultra now it would be pretty useful even in extra pulmonary tb and especially in children where they have a posse bacillary disease the newer development is also other nucleic acid amplification tests such as TrueNet, which is a make in India. It's by an Indian firm. It's still not available commercially. The advantage is it's battery operated. So in areas where electricity is a problem, uh, this test can be used. The only problem with this test is it's not fully automated as your gene expert is where you just put in the sample into the cartridge and you get a report in two hours. Instead here, you need a technician who knows how to extract the DNA and then put it into the chip. So you need somebody with a technical expertise who needs to uh, do this test. As I told you about line probe assay, uh, line probe assay picks up additional resistance. We usually do the line probe assay when we get a gene expert showing rifampicin resistance or rifampicin sensitive. If you have rifampicin sensi uh, resistance, you do the line probe assay for second line LPA that's known as your second line LPA where you have resistance to phenolones and SLI that's your second line injectables that's the aminoglycosides that is used. If you have rifampicin sensitive on uh, gene expert you do a first line LPA where you check for resistance to isoniazide. The advantage of LPA is that it gives you a result within 24 to 48 hours. So it will help you to decide whether you need to put the patient on a short term MDR regimen or an XDR treatment. So you don't really need to wait for your cultures and DST to come to decide on the treatment regimen. So if you look at this particular uh, gene expert, uh, the slide that is uh, the diagnosis of drug resistant TB by developed by the RNTCP, you done a gene expert. If you get RRTB, immediately you do the second line LPA. So you look at fluoroquinolones and the uh, injectables and then decide upon the treatment regimen that you want to give. If you have rifampicin sensitive TB, you look at the first line LP and look out for monoresistance of H. The other tests that are now available is pyrosequencing, uh, which is not available in all the labs. It's done in a few labs. It's highly uh, sensitive, very expensive. And it looks at uh, rifampicin resistance, INH, all the mutations possible, and more drug resistance. So you can pick up ethambutol and amikacin and all those. But it's not really something that is available for everybody because it's too expensive a test that is to be done. Treatment of MDRTB keeps on evolving. The guidelines keep on changing every three months. So you need to keep on getting updated all the time. 
and treatment actually it's quite complex of uh, MDRTB because you need to individualize as per the patient so this is the new classification of drugs that have been recommended so you have group A where you have levoflox, uh, bedaquiline, linozolid in children bedaquiline is still not recommended WHO recommends it in children uh, 12 years and above Government of India is still not approved for children as yet, so we are waiting for the use of bedaquiline in children. Group B is your clofazamine cyclosyrin and group C, including delaminate ethambutol pyrazinamide, becomes in group C. Your injectables go into group C. So now the recommendation is when you are devising a regimen, you need to have at least five drugs which work, of which you give three of the first group, so you give uh, moxiflox, linozolid, bedaquiline in adults. Use two of group B, so clofazamine cyclosyrin, and then if you can't make five from group A and group B, then you use any drug from group C to make a regimen of five drugs. The wonderful news is Delaminate is a new drug which is approved for children more than six years of age. WHO says that you could use it in children three years and above. It works by blocking the synthesis of mycolic acids in the cell wall of MTB. Currently, it's recommended only for pulmonary TB. The most important side effects is the QT prolongation that occurs with this drug. It is currently recommended for six months in the intensive phase. The weight bands is something that keeps on, uh, we're still not sure about the dosing in children, but what we use in children is basically 50 milligram twice a day because we hardly get children 35 kgs and above. Bedaquiline is another drug which is recommended. It uh, inhibits the ATP synthesis. At the moment, it's recommended for adult pulmonary TB. The most common side effect is the QT prolongation and a uh, lot of other interactions with this drug. So we need some more safety profile to come before we can use start using bedaquiline in children. Now if you look at the guidelines uh, which have been recommended for MDVR-TB, 2017 we had these guidelines which are very complex based on whether they were pre-XDR with quinolone resistance or pre-XDR with aminoglycoside resistance, just MDR or just an XDR and we had various regimens that were mentioned. The new guidelines have simplified it. Everybody goes on the same regimen, preferably oral therapy so that you can avoid injectable and you give it for 18 to 20 months which includes your 6 months of delaminate with levoflox, linozolid, clofazamine and cyclosyrin and then 12 months of the remaining 4 drugs and you stop the delaminate. I would like to highlight this case because MDR-TB treatment though it looks very simplified is not that simple. A 13-year-old girl came to us in February 2018. She had been diagnosed as fibrocavitatory pulmonary TB in November 2017 with RR on Gene Expert. She was started on the second line CAT4 regimen, which was prevalent at that time in 2017. She had no response and in fact she was getting worse and so she was referred to us after four months in February 2018 with respiratory distress. And uh, her culture grew MTB, which DST showed XDR. So, when we did her x-ray, it showed bilateral fibrocavitatory and bilateral upper lobe. She was started on oxygen IV fluids. We modified her uh, TB treatment. Because aminoglycosides were not working, we put her on capriomycin. We put her on high-dose moxifloxacin, clofazamine, cyclosyrin, pass, amoxclav along with imipenem. We did a baseline QT see to check whether we could put her on delaminate. She had a baseline QTC prolongation that did not respond to electrolytes corrections as well. And then we realized that it's probably moxifloxacin that has been causing this and then we had to stop her moxifloxacin and her QTC normalized. So she was started on delaminate in April 2018. So we took a long time to actually start delaminate in her. We also started bedaquiline after 15 days monitoring the QTC and uh, juggling the QTC every time we had a problem, we had to juggle the dosing of these drugs. She was finally discharged from the hospital in May 2018 after three months with a weight gain of 2 kg, no sputum production. We had to put on a central venous port so that uh, she could take uh, meropenem, that is your imipenem and capriomycin at home. Parents had to be taught how to give those drugs at home. So just to highlight these points that the problems when you're starting delaminate or bedaquiline in these children how do you monitor the QTC, how these patients do, complex regimen, how the parents have to be involved in the treatment of these patients. Treatment of MDR-TB is not that simple. There are a lot of problem issues. One is the pill burden. If you look at PASS, it's available as a powder as well as a tablet. Most children prefer to take a tablet rather than the powder. And when you're giving tablet as PASS, if I want to give six grams, I need to give six pills. So that's quite a lot of pill burden. The other issue is adherence to have somebody take an injectable for six months or have people take treatment for 18 months 
is really a problem. Adherence is a major, major issue. And if these patients are not going to uh, take the drugs from RNTCP, which is free of cost, but are going to buy, then the cost of therapy is huge. A 10 kilo child would require around 10,000 rupees for a month's therapy, and this is going to be something like 18 months to two years. So if they're going to buy these medicines, it's really a cost issue. And the side effects. Side effects is a major problem. I'll be discussing the side effects in the few uh, slides, a uh, few slides later on. And after all this, you really don't know what the final outcome of these patients are going to be. Are they going to survive? If they're going to survive, are they going to survive with normal outcome or are they going to have some mo comorbid condition like a chronic lung disease? So if you look at the side effects, aminoglycosides, if you look at this slide, which we've, this paper that we've published, none of our patients had a symptomatic hearing loss, but the hearing loss is to the tune of 31%. And most of them get it within five months of taking aminoglycoside therapy. So with this research, we actually learned that even though the guidelines mention that you need to do a hearing test every month, we don't need to do it so frequently. We could start somewhere around three months of therapy and then do it every month. So hearing is a major issue and you need to monitor because otherwise these patients lose their hearing. Nephrotoxicity is another issue where the creatinine rises, but then you need to adjust the dose. So you need to monitor these patients on therapy. You just can't leave them like that. And the type of aminoglycosides that we use when we did this research was ami uh, predominantly amikacin. Thro though in the program you get canamycin yet, the guidelines now mention that canamycin should not be used and it should be amikacin that should be used in children. The other issues that you can sometimes get is micronutrient deficiency. I'm just showing you this uh, girl who had uh, pellagra due to ethionamide. So instead of just focusing on pyridoxin, we also need to keep in mind malnutrition and micronutrient deficiency in these patients because of the medications that you're giving. And hypothyroidism, especially when you're giving PAS and ethionamide together, most of our patients, we had 53% of the patients developing a subclinical hypothyroid. None of them had clinically hypothyroidism. And most of them developed within six months. So you need to monitor the thyroid functions in this child, put them on supplements as a compensated hypothyroidism. The good news is this hypothyroid does not continue lifelong. The moment you stop the drugs, it resolves. But you need to monitor these patients. Linozolid. Linozolid is something which is very useful in drug-resistant TB. I always say that preserve your linozolid for a VRSA or for MDR-TB. The thing is, we still don't know what's the ideal dose in children. Uh, adults, it's very simple. You just use a one tablet a day of 600 milligram. In children, we have been using linozolid for some time. The most common side effects that we saw with linozolid was anemia. Tingling numbness is a major problem, especially some of them get it so irreversible uh, tingling, which on uh, your EMG NCV shows as motor, ne uh, motor neuronopathy. So you have to be very, very careful when you're using linozolid. Fortunately, none of them had a bone marrow suppression requiring uh, irreversible bone marrow suppression. So linozolid is some drug that you can keep it in children. We established the pediatric uh, DRTB center with RNTCP at Wadia Children's Hospital in May 2018. This is the first center in the country which is catering to pediatric DRTB and it's an nodal center. I'm just showing you this data that we started our TB clinic at Wadia in 2007 and over a period of time what has happened to our DRTB. As you can see the first three years our percentage of DRTB was around 5.6 percent. Next three years 2010 to 13 the total number of DRTB patients went up to 7% as compared to the total number of TB patients who were referred to the clinic. 2013 to 2016, it went up to 9.6%. So 9.6% of the total TB patients that we see are going to be MDRTB. And the kind of resistance, INH rifampicin, most of them are, but gradually the resistance for pyrazinamide is increasing over a period of time, ethambutol is increasing, streptomycin is almost out, ethionamide has gone up to the tune of 60%, oflox and moxiflox almost again 60%. So the kind of pattern that we see in Mumbai is very, very different. And we see kind of a mixed resistance pattern, which is going on to more XDR pattern now. So once we started this uh, DRTB center at Wadia in May 2018, I'm just showing you this data that from 2018 May in the year 2018, we had a total 103 patients and 2019 till now, that is till November, we had around 145 patients referred to us. 
you can see the kind of XDR that is going up. So initially it was all MDR and pre-XDR, but now we are seeing XDR on the rise. Earlier males, females used to be uh, the same amount of patients being affected, but now females are getting more affected as compared to males. So why is it seen more commonly in females is something which we need to really look at. Age group wise, predominantly older children, more than 10 years, but it's affecting all the age group, including your younger children as well. And disease, though most of your guidelines mention that pulmonary TB is the most common TB in children. If you can see our data in 2018, it was predominantly extrapulmonary TB, which we've seen over a period of time that it's predominantly extrapulmonary in children, especially lymph node TB. 2019, both pulmonary and extrapulmonary is almost to the same extent. So the highlight of this is that if you're doing a biopsy or you're trying to pick up TB in extrapulmonary sites, please go in for a microbiological diagnosis. Because if you miss out drug resistance and you start the child on first line based on a histopathological evidence or a clinical evidence, you may cause more damage to the patient rather than curing the patient. Delaminid is available in the country, but it's really in short supply. Uh, we've used Delaminid in 29 patients till now. 22, we've got it from RNTCP. Seven patients who had extra pulmonary TB, we got it from Compassionate Use Program because the government does not allow us to use it in pulmonary TB, extra pulmonary TB. And we still, I still need to analyze our data on Delaminid, but these patients seem to be doing well. Outcome-wise, if you look at the guidelines, they tell you that 50% uh, of your MDR and XDR is going to die. 2018, our death rate was around 1%. 2019, we maintained that death rate. Most of the patients are still on treatment, but they're doing well on treatment. So most important thing to remember is that individualization of therapy. It's not that I can put them on a standard therapy and then be uh, uh, relaxed that uh, it's all going to be well. I need to monitor these patients, adjust the therapy, look for the side effects, adjust the dosing. So therapy is really individualized. TB is something where a lot of new data is available now and a lot of new trials are going. There are trials on using betaquilin in children, trials of betaquilin being used for more than six months, trials of using betaquilin deliminate together. Uh, there's a new drug, pretonamid, uh, which has been approved by the US FDA recently, and a trial of betaquilin, pretomanid, and linozolid in combination for XDR TB. Even more shorter regimen for MDR. So, a lot of things happening in the era of MDR TB. So, what I speak today may be outdated in the next three months. Just to highlight that MDRPTB treatment is not that simple, a case with a lot of twists and turns. A 14-year-old girl presented in July 2016 with cervical lymph node TB. Uh, she had been diagnosed with pre-XDR TB in October 2013 and she'd received the second line treatment till October 2015. So she was on levofloxacin amikacin for six months, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, ethionamide and cyclosidin. Her current gene expert showed rifampicin sensitive, but we said, no, this is, does not seem to be possible. So we pursued the culture. The culture grew MTB, which was resistant to all the first lines, including the quinolones, suggestive of a pre-XDR TB with a mixed pattern. We started on amikacin, cyclosyrin, pass, linozolic, clofazamine. On follow-up in November 2016, uh, we had sent her to an ENT for a hearing test, and he noticed a retropharyngeal abscess in her. She had no symptoms, absolutely, and a CT scan showed an abscess right from the base of the skull to the vocal cords, compressing the pharynx. We had to do aspiration of the abscess to look whether this was a paradoxical reaction or whether this was worsening of her MDR-TB. Gene experts showed MTB with rifampicin resistance, but the culture did not grow MTB, so we thought this was a paradoxical reaction. We continued her on the same TB treatment, but we added a course of steroids for two months. And this is her CT scan. You can see the abscess, which is going from the base of the skull up right up to the vocal cord. She continued to have recurrent retropharyngeal abscesses, and we had to actually do fortnightly to monthly drainage. She required drainage almost seven to eight times. Finally, in July 2017, it was difficult to aspirate, so we did a CT, and that showed calcification of the abscess wall. And then we did not drain her any further. However, she continued to need her ATT till today, as her PET CT still shows active lesion in the cervical gland, though the abscess is now completely resolved. So this was in July 2017. You can see the calcification around the wall. The abscess is still there. And uh, subsequently, she, all this is gone except for the cervical node, which is still persistent. So I would like to conclude that uh, newer diagnostics and newer drugs are definitely available for treating MDR-TB. 
TB guidelines are constantly evolving and treatment of drug resistant TB is very very complex and needs an expert opinion thank you very much